So yeah, Ron Schweitz is my name, and yes, I have reinvigorated my passion. I'd be well and truly retired if not for, for low carb. I was sort of burning out, as uh, we've heard from others, and uh, now uh, I'm a bit more than 60, but I'm keen to go uh, for quite a few years and see what I can share in the low carb field. So this is about CGMs. So how many people in the room have used a, a CGM, a continuous glucose monitor? So quite a few, and quite a few haven't. So for those of you who've used it, I probably won't be telling you too much, but uh, we'll go anyway. So I was a senior lecturer at Monash Uni until the end of last year, and someone wants to ask me, you might want to ask me <laughs> about that. I'm happy to share that. Uh, I'm now what's called a teaching associate. I give one lecture there a year, one lecture to the four groups, so the same lecture four times. Amazingly, the, the reason I left is the, reason, is the lecture I'm giving, and that's a lecture on diabetes. Um, so I do get a little bit of a low-carb thing there. They get five minutes of low-carb medicine in my one-hour lecture. I have a special interest in type 2 diabetes, and like a lot of people uh, before me, my passion in low-carb was uh, begun by a, a family member of mine developing type 2 diabetes in her 20s. Um, so that's, that's not very good at all. Uh, this special interest led me to find out about low-carb eating, what can we do to, to help her, and um, so I got very inspired when I discovered about low-carb. Um, and so obviously I'm biased towards low carb and I've been using it both personally and professionally uh, for five years now. So when I started uh, using low carb myself, I lost about five or six kilos. I was just, uh, just would have been just over 60. And as a, as a doctor, I know that uh, when someone over 60 loses weight, there's only one reason that they lose weight and that's cancer. <laughs> and I thought, I feel so good. <laughs> this doesn't make sense. And uh, I didn't have cancer, which is great. And I'm uh, involved with the Defeat Diabetes Program, which some of you may be aware of, so I'm one of the uh, principal investigators there. So conflicts of interest are none, and I have no shares in Freestyle Libra, which, I'll be, which is a CGM that I'll be mostly talking about because it's the one that, that I use. So I'll be talking about my personal interests, which I've done, talk about case studies, and then I'll just summarise quickly. Uh, so the, the main one that I'm talking about is the Freestyle Libra. Then there are other types out there, such as the Dexcom that I know people with type 1 might be using, but they're far too expensive for people who can't afford the subsidy or don't get the subsidies. And I'm told that there'll be these new devices, these smart watches coming soon. And I think when they come, when they become available to people, when you get these smart watches that can give you readings, this is going to be a game changer and we're just going to take off because it's going to be so obvious as to what happens. So what they do um, is they give an instant and continuous glucose reading for 14 days without having to do finger, uh, frequent finger pricks, which is just fantastic. So there was a comment here from Simon uh, which, just, which talked about how useful it is to have the CGM and uh, it, it, it gives them a continuous readout and it just gives continuous information about what, what he's doing. Simon's a person with type 2 diabetes. Most of the people I talk about have type 2 diabetes. So the CGMs, the Freestyle Libra is becoming more and more advertised and we can, this is, I was just sitting at a, having a, an afternoon tea and this tram drove past Freestyle Libra too. There we go. <laughs> okay. So the patch, patches are subsidised for people with type 1 diabetes. For people who don't have type 1 diabetes, they can use the patch. Uh, so for people for type 2 diabetes, for people with metabolic syndrome, or people in, anyone interested in their metabolic health, they can use the patch, but they have to pay for it. So it's now gone up. It was about $92 about a few, few months ago, and now it's gone up to $102. And that's a patch that lasts for two weeks. As a doctor, I occasionally need to write a letter. And uh, generally, the letter's written if the patch uh, stops working. If the patch stops working, um, to, for them to get a new patch, uh, they have to, have to get this letter. And it says here, this is to certify they recommend the use of the system for RON for this off-label use. I've discussed the risks of this monitoring system with RON, so there are no risks. And RON is aware of this and wishes to use the system. So you write that and um, off they go. I, what I tell people to do is uh, change the settings on it. So they go to this little bar here, up the top right, the top corner. Then they go down to settings, down there. And then they change it from report settings, which is uh, uh, the 3.9 to 10. 10 too high. I don't know why they start there. But we try and get it in the normal range. So I tell them to set it to 7.8, then click down here at save. And then they can uh, 
then they can have their, their readings. So some of the issues. In people with type 1, it reads about 10 to 15 minutes behind the uh, real blood sugar reading because it's doing interstitial fluids. So if you're having, going to, having a hypo, it's not very good. You'll do a reading, it might be 4.5 or 5, but your real finger prick is 2.5 or 3. And I see some people with type 1 nodding, and so you need to be important. For people with type 2, it's, it's not an issue generally because they rarely have hypos. Uh, so only an issue, an issue for people on insulin. Uh, when people are sleeping on the patch, uh, it can wake you up. Does that happen to any of the people with type 1s, that it wakes you up, there's pressure on it, you don't get a good supply of fluid, yep, and so you might get a, an artefact saying that, you, saying that you're having a low, so it'll wake you up, that you've got a hypo, which you obviously, you're not having. Uh, and there can be areas in the, in the freestyle libra, which I think in the Dexcom they don't have, so the freestyle libra being a Anyway, I won't, won't use a derogatory term, but uh, it, can have de it can have areas at the beginning and the end, so they're not very accurate. And sometimes they can just have areas during it as well. One lady I, I, had, I have who's using it, her, um, her patch was reading about two and a half too high. So she was having a hypo at five, and when she finger pricked, it was actually three and a half. And when she was reading 10, it was actually seven and a half. So it just read consistently for the two weeks too high. So there can be areas, problems with accuracy. There is some evidence that CGMs can help. Uh, so there's evidence uh, that they can decrease the HbO and C of people with diabetes by about 1%. They can lead to about 10 kilograms of weight loss, and they can also lead to some loss, uh, drop in uh, blood pressure by just being aware of your insulin resistance. And they can also lead to a decrease in medications of insulin and other medications. So there is evidence that they're useful. Okay, now I'm gonna talk about the uh, dietary guidelines in a little bit. I'm actually going to say that we've had a lot of uh, bad stuff talked about the dietary guidelines, but I'm actually going to show you that th th I actually agree with them, some of them, not all of them. So Diabetes Australia guidelines, they say of the three key nutrients, fat, protein and carbs, carbs is a nutrient that will have the biggest impact on your blood glucose level. Some of the people in the room with diabetes might understand that. <laughs> yeah? well, who would have thought it? They also say when carbs are digested, they break down to form glucose, which is exactly what James said at the beginning. So how, how fascinating. The College of GPs sits on the fence a little bit more. It's not quite as definitive. The College of, Defense is, the College of GPs is a very conservative organisation. To influence the glycemic response after eating, the amount and quality of carbs may be the most important factor. Maybe. The total amount of carbs consumed compared with other macronutrients may be the major dietary factor contributing to high post sugar. So they're, they're hedging their bets, aren't they? Is this correct? Are these dietary guidelines correct? And if they are correct, why the hell are they telling people with diabetes to eat carbs? Yeah. What's the answer, James? Why are they telling them? Yeah. <laughs> 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 right. Okay, so as with most people, I did my N equals one uh, journey. Uh, so I wore a patch, um, and uh, I wanted to see what happens. Is this really true, you know? So um, I had my uh, low-carb meal, uh, my omelette with some cheese and some smoked salmon and some salad. I figured less than five grams of carbs, and this is what happened to me. I flatlined. I don't have diabetes. I don't have, I, well, I didn't, didn't think I had metabolic syndrome. So, you know, flatlined, which I thought was pretty happy with. Then for dinner, I had some... Uh, uh, some uh, meat, some more salad, and some berries and cream. I figured that was less than five grams of carbs again, and again I, I flatlined, uh, which is what, which is great, what we'd expect, and what people who have type one and eat this sort of way, that what happens to them. Uh, then I went, and I can date this. I went to my uh, uh, sister-in-law's place, who's vegetarian, for a good, healthy vegetarian meal. <laughs> Didn't take the photo, so there's no photo. But uh, we had the multi-grain bread, which was a home homemade roll. Soup, quiche, two small potato wedges. I didn't even eat my mum's birthday cake. I had the berries and cream. And uh, that's what happened to my sugar. It didn't go up that much. Again, I don't have diabetes. It took about three or four hours to settle down. So 4.8 is where I started. So it took about three or four hours. So yeah, I thought that's pretty, pretty amazing. And I figured there was about 40 grams of carbs. So about 10 teaspoons of sugar. Okay, so let's look at some of the, the people that I see. So this is a, a woman, a uh, 64-year-old woman. So she's, um, 
she's fasting, uh, and uh, you, we can see that her sugar's going up from about, starts going up from about uh, 4 o'clock in the morning until about 6.30, and it rises from 6.5 to 8. Now, I know all the people with type 1 diabetes will know why this happens, and people with type 2. Does anybody else know why this might happen? So she hasn't eaten, and I know you all know. I know. <laughs> <laughs> Does anybody else know why this has happened? So she's not eating, she's fasting. Yeah, so what's that called? That's called, um, we have a name for it, that's called the dawn phenomenon. So the body's producing cortisol to get the body ready for, for the day. Uh, the cortisol stimulates the liver to produce glucose, and in people who aren't glucose resistant, uh, insulin's, uh, develop, uh, insulin's produced then. Uh, the insulin then allows, opens the cells to let the glucose in, and because you're insulin, the person's insulin resistant, it doesn't work, so the sugar goes up. Um, okay. This is a CGM on a 62-year-old woman with type 2 diabetes. So we see this, it's gone up quite suddenly. So the question I always ask is, where is the sugar coming from? And uh, so I, I simply asked, you know, what happened? What did you do at uh, about 7 o'clock? And she says she has a latte, milk coffee, 10 grams of, of carbs, 2.5 teaspoons of sugar. That's what it gets broken down to, roughly. Um, interestingly, at lunchtime, she has her lunch, which is a can of tuna and a flat white, so a tiny bit of milk. I figure it's about one or two grams of carbs, and she flat lines. In fact, she drops a little bit, but uh, I think that's pretty much flat lining. So just goes to show the difference. This is a 72-year-old Cambodian man. What's the significance? Uh, as a lecturer tutor at Monash Uni, when, whenever we give quizzes or, or any questions, every word in the thing is of significance. So when you have something like this, you know, why did I put in Cambodian? Anybody know? No. Eats lots of rice. Eats lots of rice. Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it's, it, 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 that's good. So he actually has rice for breakfast. Where is the sugar coming from? He has rice for breakfast. He has a bowl of rice for breakfast, approximately 40 grams of carbs, 10 teaspoons of sugar. So I have this conversation with him. It was actually his son. He's only here, he was only here for a three-month uh, holiday, but I have this conversation by his son explaining what this does. He now made an informed decision to continue eating rice three times a day. That was his love. That was his life. He could see what happened. His son explained it to him. I could see his son was pulling his hair out. But he said he's not going to give up rice. That's his, uh, that's, that's his decision. But he can at least make that as an informed decision. He can now see what it's doing to him. And he can understand, anyone can understand that 16 is not a good reading. I didn't bother recalibrating his glucometer to, um, you know, to, to the 7.8 because he was never getting anywhere near the range. So you don't want to depress people. Uh, Simon, who we were meant to hear earlier on, 67-year-old um, man with type 2. Uh, so he was running with his HBO in season 7. He discovered low carb uh, two years ago. HBO and C's now in the mid fives. So he was kind enough to do this experiment. He had this breakfast. You can work out what this is. It's a no name uh, breakfast cereal. I'm not allowed to <laughs> say brands, um, but you can use your imagination. Um, about 30 grams of carbs there. And then he, he compared that to this other one, um, which is two eggs, salmon, and some cheese. And which one do we think uh, affected the glucose more? <laughs> so it's a big question, isn't it? So let's have a look. He, he did this experiment. That was the uh, no-name breakfast cereal, and that was the uh, salmon flat lining versus uh, the uh, ski slope. So pretty clear, I'd say. Uh, he says uh, this had a, an obvious effect and really helped him in making a decision on which way he was going to go in, uh, uh, in, in his food choices. So this is Frank, who's a 31-year-old uh, guy with type 2, and he's got these two peaks here. So how did these two peaks happen? So he had a latte. Again, you can see it raised his sugars you know, up to about uh, 9. And then he had two chops and, and four kebabs. He actually thought this was quite healthy. And I thought, well, it should be healthy. And then he looked on the packet. I said, does it say anything on the packet? And he looked on the packet, and he realised that the four kebabs, actually with all the extras, processed, it was processed meat, so it had... Uh, nearly 14 grams of carbs in it, so there we go. Uh, and there's Frank, and who would have known that he had lunch this time at a restaurant, so he's eating out um, chilli scrambled eggs with feta, carizo, mushrooms and bacon, no bread, 
and maybe one gram of carbs and we can see how he's flatlining. And uh, these are his HbA1c, so he was going 7, 7.3. Frank uh, went low carb around February, or just before February, and it went down to 6.5. And these CGMs actually give you HbA1c estimates if you were to continue. And uh, on his uh, HbA1c estimate, his average was 6.7, his estimate was 5.8. So, you know, he's, he's, uh, he's you know, now in the non-diabetic range, which is just fantastic. And David, David was kind enough to do an experiment where he tested three different breakfasts. One was, uh, I mean, patients are so nice, you know, they, you know, I, I just sort of say, that, say, and they sort of say, oh, look, I'll do it for you, doc. Mm, don't make yourself sick, that's okay. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Did you find that? <laughs> yeah. So day one, he had breakfast of oats and milk, 35 grams of carbs, I guessed. Day two, breakfast of eggs and bacon, tomato and toast, so about 18 grams of carbs with a piece of toast. And then the day three, the same breakfast, but just without the, uh, without the, the toast. So, okay, we know what the answer is, don't we? But let's just have a look. The oats pushes it up to 11, and this is a good healthy breakfast. This is on many diabetic websites. Uh, the toast uh, pushes it up to uh, 8.9, and flat lines on the same breakfast without the toast. And uh, Robin's a 58-year-old woman with type 2 since 2019. Here she is uh, again. We need to find out what's happened here. And basically she said she had uh, quiche for lunch. Uh, Robin's very excited about what's happened. She's had diabetes for, for a number of years. She's been not very well controlled. Um, and her 14-day readout showed that uh, her HbA1c was 5. Point, uh, her, her average was 5.9 and that equates to a HbA1c of 5.2. So she's done you know, quite well. She's come down from 6.5, 5.9 to 5.2. She's very happy. So going back to these uh, guidelines that I said that I agree with, some of them. Uh, so they say, you know, carbs are the thing that have the biggest impact. When they break down, they, f they turn into glucose. And the colleges, you know, take on it as a little bit more gently. But I think they're correct. I don't think there's any question they've got it right. Somehow they just... Uh, they're putting it into practice, they seem to have got it wrong somewhere. Okay, so for those of you who don't have type 1 or, or type 2, have you been paying attention? As, a, as a, an ex-lecturer, I, I have to give, uh, can't finish without a quiz. So we've got this 61-year-old man who's, uh, uh, who, who tested out these two different uh, foods. He had his uh, fish, uh, fish with some greens and a very small amount of pumpkin and the low GI oat bar. And we've got these two graphs. So, so, so meal one is at graph A, graph B, and meal two is at graph A. Yeah. So obviously it is. Yep. Uh, so uh, that's graph A. He actually said when he was he he, he wasn't doing this as an experiment, but he, he just took the photo up. He said I, I started eating this oat bar, thinking it was healthy. Couldn't believe what happened. What was happening to my sugar? So I threw away the second half. That's why I only had half. <laughs> he said, you know, so, um, yeah. Okay. So we've got some feedback from Simon and Adam, but that won't work. But they're just saying basically what I've said, how useful it is. Um, Adam said the one, uh, the one negative, he said, is that uh, uh, your doctor constantly uh, gets his feedback and so can, uh, can pester you. And I, I said to him, Adam, you can turn me off at any time. <laughs> And, and, and he said, and I've had one patient do that. Yeah. <laughs> All of a sudden they just disappeared. <laughs> um, and he said, he calls me Dr. Ron. He says, Dr. Ron, I was only joking. Your feedback is fantastic. So, yeah. so they, they're a, I think they're a very useful tool, tool to help give instantaneous feedback to people with diabetes and metabolic syndrome, and they can help people uh, control these conditions. Um, and I think, uh, I think when these smart devices have them, I think it'll be a game changer and it'll be a low carb will be a complete no brainer. Mm. Thank you.